Now, the last two problems in this chapter are just so you can see different applications, but you don't have to do the okay. work. You know, you just okay. read through the problem and then you see, okay. And if you're doing some more biological thermodynamic calculations, mm -hmm. then you could look and think back, maybe I saw this before, and then something okay. like that. But as far as having to do this particular uh, thing, um, it would, as far as coupled reactions go, it would be much, much simpler coupled reactions that we do. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, you're right. Um, this focus on 13-1 coupled reactions in biological systems seems to be missing from there. I went through the book. The Gibbs, but anyway, we could we could look at this um, briefly now. The Gibbs energy available from the complete combustion of one mole of glucose from carbon dioxide. So, you know, all I did here was um, thermodynamics deals with state functions, and state functions only depend on the final state and the initial state. So it doesn't matter how many steps you do this in. Like in, if we burn this, you know. There are hundreds of um, elementary processes going on, basically. There are thousands of possible paths in a flame. But a flame appears to be happening in one step, you know, because you burn it, you get CO2 and water. But in biological systems, this happens in a series of long, drawn out steps. We call these cycles, metabolic cycle. But regardless, if you burn this in a flame or you burn this in your body, you're going to get the same delta G um, because delta G just depends on the chemical potential difference between where you start and where you end, and it's the same. And so, well, the first part here is, okay, uh, this reaction generates energy. What's that energy used for? Now. Um, can you use 100% of that energy for work? And typically, um, no. I mean, when you think about converting potential energy into work, you can get pretty high efficiency. I, I, the other problem here was using a heat engine. Heat engines are, you know, um, inefficient ways of converting energy into work. Right? And then you have this thing called the Carnot cycle, which they talk about. Are you guys familiar with what problem that was? 102, yeah. 102, right. And so something like this, where you're converting um, heat into work, heat transfer into work, isn't so efficient. And there is a limit to how much. And so this is one way of thinking about that here. Unless you had infinite temperature, if you had infinite temperature, then it could get high efficiency with it. But it, 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 in general, it's pretty low efficiency. When we're converting not heat but chemical potential energy into work, it's much more efficient. But still, you're going to lose, you know, because when we convert energy, um, it gets converted in the form of work and heat. And so we're always going to have some heat component to this. But in this particular problem, we're going to convert all this energy into making ATP. And we're going to assume that no energy is lost. That's heat. And so, so basically, um, what we have to do is we have to figure out how many um, kilojoules per mole uh, it costs to convert one ADP into one ATP. And, um, I looked up that number. I don't know where it was in the book, and then just did a division. You know, I think it, I think it was what seventy something. So, and you have this much energy, and it costs that much. Let's say it costs a hundred kilojoules per mole, then you convert twenty-eight. That kind of thing. It's actually much higher. The actual number of moles of ATP um, that converted to 38, so we could just calculate the efficiency by time that. And so where does the other energy go? So we'll talk about other energy like the heat, um, which is also important. Uh, and then consider these typical uh, physiological conditions. And then we have this delta G naught prime. 
And so you, you should just be aware of that. And so this, this problem you don't have to do in, in, in detail. The last two problems here, this is what I think I, I said in the Zoom, but it might have gotten cut out. These last two problems are just kind of read it and look at it. And then that's, it. A, that's about it. Just, just read it. Okay. Think about it. But, um, if you go into this, like, 102 is important if you're going into, like, engineering or something like that. 103 is important if you go into biology. You know, if you go into biology, then we have this, you know, this biological thermodynamics class, which you deal with delta genes and all this other stuff. And, and if you're interested in, in and of course, in biology, energy is very important. And so um, when we look at coupled reactions, we look at this. Like, this is something I had to memorize, you know, this student. To memorize the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Or the citric acid cycle. So there's kind of stuff, you know. Um, yeah, you have to memorize this and then like NAD plus NADH, etc. These are other energy molecules, mitochondria. Okay. So these are all coupled reactions here. We do it this way. And so we look at the delta G's. And it's fact that there's a whole chapter when you're looking at all the delta G's for each individual step here. And then you're looking at delta G for this reaction, delta G for that reaction, and that kind of stuff. And so that's Okay, and then the, the other thing to note is that biological standard conditions are different than temperature. Well, the, the, you know, standard thermodynamic conditions don't have a temperature. You could do any temperature you want, but the thing that's different, um, so there's no standard temperature, but the, the most common temperature is 25 degrees C. And in biology, it's going to be warmer, right, because uh, mm -hmm. at least human biology is going to be warmer the temperature, and uh, the concentrations, the concentration of H plus can't be one molar, because if you have one molar H plus concentration, let's say you have acid present and you want to do it under standard conditions, it's got to be at one molar, you're not going to have one molar because that'd be pH zero, and with, and like for example your blood, uh, it's not going to be pH zero. You know, just slight changes in pH um, can um, just change the structure of a lot of protein because they start to interfere over the hydrogen bonding and that kind of stuff. In fact, that was the whole that was the whole deal with the whole deal with um, hydroxychloroquine. Have you heard of hydroxychloroquine? Hydroxychloroquine got a um, got a lot of press, but um, hydroxychloroquine just changes the pH just slightly inside the cell. And so that was the reason that people were looking at hydroxychloroquine for treating lots of um, diseases, because that slight change in pH could denature certain proteins that are important for whatever is infecting the cell, uh, causing it to do that. Measuring pH, that was one of the labs I was thinking about um, this semester, is how do you measure the pH inside a cell? There are different ways that people measure the pH inside a cell. One way is they have these micro um, pH probes that they can actually put inside the cell, but it ends up um, causing some severe damage to the cell, to their membrane. So intracellular fluid can leak out. So there are non-invasive ways to measure the pH. One of those is introducing certain things that you can probe molecules, called molecular probes. So these molecules get taken up by the cell. 
and we can probe those using spectroscopy. But anyway, um, decided not to do it this semester. Okay, so don't worry about 102 and 103. Let's just read the question, just have it in the back of your mind. Okay, other questions? Okay, when you turn, I looked at some of these, and when you turn it in, make sure you have the rate law written. You know, some of these, um, this is good. So if you have the rate law and the derivation, that's good. I just. I, well, the, I, I need to see you know, the the final result, which is you know, the rate okay. law, which is, okay. you know, and if you show the, der you know, the calculations, it's good. To, what's that? You can do it by hand, but it's not just the graphs. You know? So some people are thinking, oh, they just need to turn in the graphs. And that's it. Any other questions? All right, so uh, chapter 13, then, I'll go through multiple choice. So we did a non-standard. Non-standard is pretty straightforward. You just calculate Q. So we can calculate the the voltage anywhere in the, so looking at the Z um, 2 plus, the copper 2 plus ratio here and how the, the voltage changes. So the more um, product you have, for, so this is minus um, um, 0.592, not a plus term. And so as the zinc, zinc is a product here, this is the reactant, the zinc concentration builds up, the voltage is going to go down. It's minus 0.0592 for over Z. And so it's product over reactants. And under standard conditions, it's E naught. Yeah. yeah. Under standard conditions, the, the, the thing with the battery is it's only under standard conditions. Wow. So if you have a battery, it might start off under standard conditions, but immediately when you start using it, the concentrations change, and therefore the voltage changes. And so standard conditions is a reference point here. And it's kind of nice because we can compare standard conditions with everything, but in reality, it's just one data point in a series of data points. That's not good because, you know, immediately when you start using the battery, the voltage drops. Well, how much does voltage drop? Well, we're at 1.1 volts here. This is the wall. Uh, so um, this would be like a 10 to 1 ratio product reactant, 100 to 1 ratio. You can see the voltage is starting to drop significantly. Yeah. For powering electrical devices, that's a problem you know, um, when, when it changes. Here we, we can see that the voltage changes significantly from the standard conditions. We did this calculation yesterday. Um, let's, let, I'm sorry. Let's look at some application of um, batteries. One application of, uh, of electrochemistry is the pH meter. In fact, when you look at your, the pH meters that we have, um, on the display of the lab quest, it displays in addition to pH, it displays, you know what? Volts, millivolts. And what the calibration does is it calibrates the millivolts with the pH, you know, the number. So you put it into a buffer, the pH meter just measures the millivoltage, and then um, you punch in the pH it's supposed to read, and then it, it calibrates it that way. Well, this is, uh, this is uh, you'd never build a, a pH meter like this, but this is what we call a concentration cell. So we have an SHE on the left, the anode is an SHE, and the cathode is an SHE. The cathode is an SHE under standard conditions, so we have one molar H plus on the right. 
On the left, we have to have less. So x needs to be less than one molar. And so this is going to be a tug of war. Um, the H plus is equal in strength as far as oxidizers. So both of these beakers have oxidizers. But which side wins is the one, you know, that's going to be strength in numbers versus just overall strength. And so strength in numbers here, if we keep this one molar and we have this less than one molar, let's say half a molar, then if there's a tug of war between the cathode and the anode, um, the cathode is going to win the electrons. Does that make sense? Why is the right place Because the concentration is higher. And so, what, what is, well, we like to draw it out. If we were to draw out this cell, we'll have platinum here. But both sides of the cell are designed to look identical because they're the same. And so, we have SAG here, except this one's not going to be standard. And so, let's cross that out. And then over here, we're going to have SAG. And so, what we'll, we're going to have over here is this is a standard hydrogen electrode, so the H plus has to be a one molar. And then we're going to bubble hydrogen gas through here. If we want to do this under true standard condition, uh, we have to bubble hydrogen gas at one molar. It doesn't make sense to bubble hydrogen gas through this, the cathode. You know why? It doesn't make sense to bubble hydrogen gas. Through the cathode because it's a waste. This is a waste of hydrogen gas. You'd never do this in reality. You wouldn't want to do this because all the hydrogen gas is being wasted because what's the product? Well, H plus, two H pluses are going to take two electrons to form H2 gas. And so H2 gas is the product because at the cathode, we're going to have reduction occur. In other words, the oxidizer is going to take the electrons to form hydrogen gas. So we're forming hydrogen gas, but in order to do this under standard conditions, we have to do this. We have to add this, otherwise the potential isn't going to be the same. And so having hydrogen gas here is actually going to lower the potential here. The reduction potential would be higher if we didn't have the hydrogen gas here. We did this under non-standard conditions. Does that make sense? And so why are we adding product here? You know, because the product of this reaction is hydrogen gas. And so it makes no sense to add hydrogen gas to that because you're making hydrogen gas. And so all that H2 gas is being wasted. Well, why are we wasting it? Because we want to do it under standard conditions. The standard conditions are very restrictive. In reality, you can never do it under standard conditions because it would be such a waste of hydrogen. Hydrogen is expensive. You never want to waste it like that. Over here, we need the bubble hydrogen gas because over here, the reaction is hydrogen gas goes to 2H plus plus two electrons. And so we're going to bubble hydrogen gas here. And the hydrogen gas we need here because that's the actual reactant. And we're going to put in one bar. So we'll do it under standard conditions. And the bubbles will come into contact with the platinum. When those bubbles of hydrogen gas come into contact with platinum, then um, two electrons are stripped from this and fed into the circuit, and then we'll, we'll end up with two H pluses yeah, as product. So H plus is a product here. And so if we did this under standard conditions, then we have to have one molar H plus. But the more H plus we have, the lower the oxidation potential is going to be because there's more product. Does that make sense there? So why are we adding H plus here? Well, actually we don't want to add any H plus there. In fact, I wouldn't add any H plus here because it doesn't make sense to add H plus there. It's just going to lower the oxidation potential and we get less voltage. So anyway, how does this battery work? Because when you look at the reaction, it's H2 plus 2H plus yields 2H plus plus H2. How, what's the driving force for this? There would be no driving force for this. Under standard conditions, what's the voltage? Zero. 
Under standard conditions, this would be zero volts. There's no driving force behind it. If you had a tug of war, H plus versus H plus, it'd be a tie. And H2, um, you know, H plus is trying to take the electrons. It'd be a tie. But what we're going to do is we're going to do it under non-standard conditions. That is, we're going to make this H plus stronger. Now, how do you make this H plus stronger? Yeah, more we strengthen numbers. So we're going to make this H plus one molar, and we're going to make this H plus much less than one molar. If we make this H plus much less than one molar, then which side's going to win? Yeah, yeah it's going to go four. Yeah. And we could easily reverse this. We can make this much bigger, this much smaller. Which direction it would go, it would go reverse. And so by making this one big, one molar, and this one small, then we're going to generate voltage. And so what we're going to have is the H plus here has to be one molar big. And then the H plus here has to be much less than one molar small. And so if we have much less than one molar over here, then the electrons are going to flow left to right. Now the voltage is we're going to get a voltage from this. And then what we can do is we can relate the voltage to the pH for this. And so... Uh, this would be a simple pH meter, and th this much less than, we'll, we'll just call X. X is much less than one molar. Would we ever have to solve for that X? Yeah, we can solve for that X. And we would have to be given, like, the E of the E naught of the cell, right? Well, E naught of the cell is pretty easy for this one, because if we do this under standard conditions, then it's a tie. One molar versus one molar. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. And so what we can do is we'll just do the calculation now. E of the cell is equal to E naught of the cell um, minus 0 0.0592. You don't have to memorize this equation. Divided by N or Z. I'll call it Z now. Log of Q. Z is going to be 2. There are 2 electrons transferred in the balanced chemical reaction. So Z is 2 moles of electrons. Q is the products of reactants. So when we look at the product, the product is H plus in this beaker. Over here, that's the product. And over in this beaker, the product is H2. And so it goes, this is, this is the way it goes. It goes anode, reactant product is anode. Cathode, reactant product. And so Q is going to be the H plus, which is much less than one molar. So we'll just call it H plus in the anode. And then the H plus in the cathode is um, one molar. Okay, and then the pressure, you know, um, actually I'll just do this, H plus in the cathode, product over reactant, so this is a reactant, and this is going to be one, yeah, the, the pressure of the hydrogen, okay, this will be the product hydrogen, the product hydrogen is in the cathode, you know, as we can see there, that will be the cathode on the right side, and so this is going to be one bar, so this is one divided by the partial pressure of hydrogen in the anode, which will also be one. So Q is equal to the H plus concentration in the anode. So E naught of the cell is zero volts because uh, there's no difference between the left and the right side. And so this is going to equal point uh, negative. Uh, actually, what 
0.0592 volts over 2 log of the H plus concentration in the anode. Well, then I'm going to do this. I'm going to, um, this is 0.0592 divided by 2. <clears throat> So we've got 0.0296, and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to call this negative log of the H plus of the anode. So what is the negative log of H plus equal to? pH. And so we have pH is equal to E of the cell. Well, actually, let me do it this way. 1 over 0 0.0296 times um, E of the cell. And so we just convert the uh, voltage into pH here by using this slope. And then you would be given E to the cell. Yeah, you would be given E to the cell, and then you can, you can just uh, determine what the pH is. But you didn't... You would never build a pH meter like this. And so this is just an example of a concentration cell, um, which would be, which could be used as a pH meter, but who would want to use a pH meter where you're bubbling hydrogen gas? It would be very dangerous a pH meter to use. So what we do is we use a modern, a modern day uh, pH meters. Operating the same, we generate a voltage. These ones are pH sensitive glass here. And so on the surface, it can, um, it's measured um, differences in charge between inside and outside. And differences in charge between inside and outside here will lead to voltage, and that voltage could be uh, recorded. So these are these glass bowl ones. These are different. Style of pH meter, old style of pH meters here. And so, um, where the, the electrode um, different potential. Yeah. We're not going to get into the uh, design of electrodes. But, um, but um, these, one thing uh, would be glass bowl, if you don't want it to dry out. It's a gel on the surface, and the gel on the response is very slow. And so these pH meters can be very sluggish, especially if they've been dry for some period of time. Then you try to record a pH, and it takes hours, hours for it to get done. So they have to be um, well conditioned, the electrodes. That's why I, I personally um, prefer a different type of pH meter. Which looks like um, this is ion sensitive field effect transistor uh, pH. So these these have pretty rapid response and they're really robust. You don't have to condition them in solution. You let them dry out. It's not a problem. You can measure semi-solids. You, you, you don't have to have much sample either, just a drop. And so these are they're much better. And the cost of these is they're coming down. So I used to have these right here. The micro electro. This is what it looks like. So there's just a little silicon chip at the end there. I mean, you just put a little drop of sample there. You measure pH. 
Just convert a, a voltage reading into pH. Okay, there's another application that's that's called a concentration cell. Concentration cell is the same cell for the anode and the cathode. The only difference is strength in numbers. You know? And so if you look at this concentration cell, look at the anode. The anode is lead to lead 2 plus. The cathode is lead 2 plus to lead. The same, they're the same. But the only difference is, okay, this is reactant product. Over here, this is reactant product. And so what we have to do is we have to make it uneven in strength. So in other words, the reactant here concentration, the lead 2 oxidizer, because we want the oxidizer to be in the cathode, because this is where reduction occurs. So the oxidizer needs to be there. And therefore, we can't have as much lead. So the lead 2 plus has to be smaller here. Otherwise, electrons aren't going to go to the cathode. So this one is, um, this is a concentration cell used to determine KSP. So if you put in saturated lead iodide, lead 2 iodide here, the concentration of lead in that solution is very low. And that's going to generate a voltage. And this is the voltage that we generate here. From this voltage, we can determine what the concentration of the lead ion is in here. And so let's go ahead and do that. And then from that, we can determine the KSP. And so this gives us a way of determining KSP experimentally. Now, there are, of course, there are other ways you can just Way out, <laughs> way out. How much, how how many grams dissolved? Might be easier just to weigh it. But um, no, we might as well try this one here, especially especially if a very very small amount dissolved. If a very small amount dissolved, then uh, you're going to have rel high relative errors in uh, mass measurement. And so for this, E of the cell is equal to you know E naught of the cell. Minus 0 0.0592 volt over Z log of Q. So all concentration cells are going to have a standard cell potential of 0 volts because if I put in the same on both sides, uh, this doesn't even have to be under standard conditions. If I put 0 0.100 molar here and I put 0 0.100 molar here, then it's a tie. No, and so if the concentration is the same, it need not be under standard conditions, it's still going to be zero volts, you know, the, the cell potential. Now here, if it's one molar versus one molar, it's going to be a tie. Z, uh, how many electrons are transferred? You probably can see how many electrons. Lead has got to lose how many electrons to lead two plus. Two electrons, and then, and so at the anode, we have this reaction occur. Lead is going to go to lead 2 plus, plus 2 electrons. So this is the anode half reaction, or oxidation. Oxidation occurs at the anode. Oxidation occurs because we had to generate electrons. Those electrons are going to be fed to the cathode, so the cathode is going to consume those. And at the cathode, the lead 2 ions consume the electron form lead metal. So this would be the cathode. Reduction occurs at the cathode. Now, it's always confusing because at the anode, if we're generating electrons, this must be the reducing agent, and this must be the oxidizing agent over here at the cathode. So Z is 2. Q is, okay, um, Q is equal to the products over the reactant. So what we have to do is we have to go back over here to the cell diagram and go reactant product. So this is the product. This would be the lead concentration in the anode. This is a PB2 plus concentration in the anode. And then we go to the cathode. This is reactant product in the cathode. So the product is lead metal here. And so the reactant over here is lead metal, activity is 1, right here is lead metal, and the reactant here is lead 2 at 0.100 molar. So, uh, 
0.100 molar is our lead concentration in the cathode, and that's big here. And so this would be Q. So, um, in the case of the calculation, we're going to get this 0.0567 volt is equal to minus um, 0.0296. Um, volts log of the lead two concentration in the anode divided by 0.100. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate. So I'm going to take um, 0 0.0567, 0 0.0567, divided by 0 0.0296. Um, and then I'm going to uh, take the anti-wall. And then times it by 0 0.1, times 0 0.1. And so I get the left two concentration at the anode is equal to 0 0.0012147 molar. So that's a saturated solution. And so what we're going to do is this is going to be the equilibrium concentration here. And so we can go back to KSP, which is going to require KSP equation and P equal plus this T. Uh, what salt is this? PBI2, minus two IIs. So um, we'll go zero, zero, plus S, plus two F. And then we'll have S and two F. Yeah. And so, um, so we see that the lead concentration at equilibrium is equal to the solubility. So this is equal to the solubility. And then the KSP, KSP is equal to, um, it's going to be S times 2S quantity squared, which is going to be 4 S Q. Let's go ahead. So I'm going to Q S and then times by 4. So 7.1687 7 times 10 to the negative 9. Um, the lab uh, looks like 3 sig fig. Yeah. 7.17. Let's, uh, let me take a look at the KSP for PBI2 and let's compare it to. It depends on the source. We see a lot of different KSPs. So they have a KSP of 1.4 times 10 to minus 8. So that's 7.1687. 1.4 times 10 to minus 8. 1.4 times 10 to minus 8. 8.7 times 10 to minus 9. Well, it's getting closer. That's closer. But, you know, when you see this kind of variation, it's not very comforting to see this big, an order of magnitude variation in the KSP online. It's not, big, especially for PBI2. Um, PBI2, um, solubility isn't because um, it depends on what we're measuring here, because this is free PB2 plus. 
But in PDI2, I don't know if anybody did the calculation. Normally, when I have people do um, visual med tech, I have them do PDI2. Because um, in PDI2, our book shows this small thing where there's a whole bunch of, this is my pair. And my pair is not, this would be PDI plus, etc. And so PDI plus, what we're going to be there, and it's not going to be able to measure that. And many other species, PDI2. I have a question. How did we deal with the law? Yeah. Production. You explained it, but I didn't get it. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't get like what the rule would be. Or could you do like the law of the numerator minus law of the denominator? You could do it that way. What I did was I just, what I did was I just did the, um, did I do it with the yeah. Oh, okay. Right. I see. And then, yeah, once I get got that, I, I got this. Got I still had Very difficult. Right, and I I remember um, you know for um, graduate school I had to take the GRE and I had to take the GRE math, which is mostly algebra. And I thought algebra is going to be so easy, and then uh, I didn't study it all for it. And then when I saw my result, then I was just uh, I realized I don't know algebra. Mm -hmm. I got like, um, which is bad for a science person, but uh, I got uh, like 70, 77 percentile. It's really bad for science. So when I went to interviews, everybody asked me about my algebra score, or my, my math, my math GRE score. What did you say? Oh, <laughs> Um, well, it was. They asked me jokingly. I mean, it was kind of funny. I mean, because I guess they did, the chemistry. I did very well on, but the, um, and so they didn't really care. I think the math. Was, um, fortunately, I, I think if I did poorly on the chemistry and I did poorly on the math, I mean, that would have been a different story. Yeah. But chemistry was like. Um, pretty much, pretty high. which was kind of lucky because you don't know what's going to be on there you know, um, because chemistry is such a diverse it's a huge field and sometimes things aren't covered you know like if I was like a more biochemist maybe I'd spend a lot more time talking about biological standard conditions and biological thermodynamics you know, it depends on your instructors and what they'd like to emphasize. And then it also depends on the test writers. So I remember I took the standardized ACS exam in um, general chemistry. When I was taking general chemistry, it was a, a national test. And uh, and then there are so many questions I didn't didn't know at all. They weren't covered in you know, my class. So... Anyway, um, so one of the biggest applications of, of electrochemistry, uh, redox, is batteries. So, and one of the things about batteries is voltage drop. You know, as the cell operates, the Nernst equation says the voltage is going to drop. But a lot of devices require some minimum voltage in order to operate. And what that, what that leads to is very, very short lifetime for batteries. And so what people thought is they need to get around this. They got to get rid of the voltage drop. And so how do you get rid of the voltage drop? Um, the way you could get rid of the voltage drop is to use as many pure liquids and pure solids as possible. Because the more solids and liquids you use, the concentration doesn't change, the activity doesn't change, therefore the voltage doesn't change. 
And so a lot of time was spent in trying to determine, you know, um, for example, ZN2 plus, if the product ZN2 plus increases, then the oxidation potential is going to decrease. If the oxidation potential decreases, then the overall cell voltage decreases. Because the cell voltage is going to be the oxidation potential plus the reduction potential. The same thing here. As the hydroxide concentration increases, then what's going to happen? Well, the reduction potential is going to decrease, and if both of these decrease, then of course the cell potential is going to decrease, and then that's going to be problem. So how, how can we fix this? Well, one way to fix this is getting rid of the ZN2+. Plus. You know, is there a way we can get rid of the ZN2+. Plus? Well, we can use some chemistry to get rid of the ZN2+. Plus. And how can we get rid of the hydroxide? Well, is there a way to get rid of the hydroxide? Yeah, we can use some chemistry because hydroxide is a base. ZN2+, plus can react with a lot of things. It's, um, for example, metathesis or complexing. And so... So, for example, here, the hydroxide is easy to get rid of if we throw in some ammonium in here. And so in this mixture, we throw in some ammonium chloride. Well, what, what happens when the hydroxide is generated? When the hydroxide is generated, the ammonium reacts with the hydroxide to produce ammonia. But ammonia is a gas. And if you get too much gas in here, it's going to potentially explode, you know, especially if you throw this in a fire or something like that, right? And, and so you got to watch out. Well, well, we got to get rid of that ammonia gas because we don't want little pressure bombs as batteries. And so, is there a way to get rid of ammonia? Well, there is because zinc, zinc happens to like ammonia to form a complex. And so here we can complex zinc to form the diamine zinc ion. But if we form this diamine zinc, well, that's still aqueous. But it turns out that the chloride of this is insoluble, and so the chloride will precipitate. And so here's a, here's a great way. We can get rid of the hydroxide, and we can get rid of the zinc in a very compact fashion, like this. And if we get rid of those, that's not going to uh, decrease the, the cell potential of this. And that means that this battery is going to maintain a stable voltage until you run out of reactants or close to it. And so these are... Um, those are dry cells. You know, you don't want a bunch of aqueous solution in there. And so, what is the um, what is the anode? The anode is zinc. And so, inside the case is coating of zinc. And the cathode is weird. The cathode is manganese dioxide or manganese peroxide. And manganese peroxide is a solid. And so, it's, it's kind of weird. How does a solid come into contact with the electrode? The electrode here, the cathode is an inert electrode, which is graphite. Graphite is Pretty unreactive. And then what we need is we need the manganese oxide to come into contact, but the manganese oxide is a solid, and the solids don't move usually. And so what they do is they, they embed the manganese oxide in graphite case, this kind of black case. And graphite is a conductor of electricity. And so as long as the manganese oxide is in contact with graphite, and graphite is in contact with this graphite, then we're going to have electricity flow and the oxide is an oxide. And so we have this black case. Or the oxidizing agent here. And so this is a standard cell uh, heavy duty battery. The difference between a heavy duty battery, HD, and an alkaline battery is in an alkaline battery, instead of putting ammonia in there, um, they put in hydroxide in there. And what's going to happen is the hydroxide will uh, react with the CN2 plus to precipitate us zinc hydroxide. I think alkaline batteries are more expensive because hydroxide is more expensive. Sodium hydroxide or lithium hydroxide or whatever, but they last longer. When battery leaks, what is the battery acting? What is car batteries? When car batteries leak, it's very acidic because there's sulfuric acid in car batteries, and so and the pH is like probably below zero in some of those. What about the standard AA batteries? No. So what's leaking out of it? Well, the, 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 what's leaking out of it is some of these ammonium salts that you'll probably see in some of the paint. But usually you see some corrosion occur because they like this zinc. This is the zinc metal inside of a steel can, and the steel can can corrode. And some of the electrolyte in here can leak out, which would be ammonium salts and other things. 
like a leaf out. You wash those away among yourselves. So if you have some white or some other stuff in here, it could be some of these. Well, you know, like manganese oxide, this is in geology, they call it desert varnish. You know, so if you've been to like the red rocks, the red part of the red rocks is this desert varnish or the black part, you know, like that, um, some of those. So it's not very hazardous, this whole thing. Ammonium chloride is not very thing, you know. But of course, ZN2 plus, you know, kids get poisoned by eating, you know, pennies or whatever. Let's see, ZN2 plus will cause problems. Uh -huh. Oh, you could, you can't recharge the battery, but you could um, maybe preserve its life longer. Um, because uh, maybe it's just to extend the shelf life of the battery. It's, putting anything will slow it down. And there's going to be corrosion processes. So if you look at old batteries, you might already see some corrosion occurring in the case. These aren't stainless steel cases. If these were stainless steel cases, then we wouldn't worry so much about it. But the steel's going to be starting to get corroded away mm -hmm. on these. No, no, it depends on the recharge. There's rechargeable battery. It depends on how easy it is to reverse these reactions. This reaction is not easy to reverse, and so what ends up happening is you end up forming different things. And so this is a very difficult battery to, to recharge. So these are what we call primary. Primary means non-rechargeable because of Reverse reaction is difficult to achieve. Um, and then certain things aren't like, you know, like th this is a secondary battery. This is rechargeable. This is a car battery. But each time you recharge it, it doesn't, you know, when you, when you get it brand new, it looks nice. And you look at all the plates, the plates look nice. But each time you recharge it, it doesn't go back to that nice looking plate. It, it, you know, it tends to um, become more disordered. And less. So batteries like this will have a finite life cycle, and they they, um, they measure this. How many charge cycles can this battery be recharged before everything is just totally disordered and it, it doesn't hold much charge? And so batteries are getting better because you know. And this is all this part about people thinking about crystal formation and all this stuff. This is important here because it depends on how the crystals grow. So if you're going to plate lead back on here, and you're, you're forming like dendritic crystals that look like trees, and then, and then they can actually lead to an internal short here or something like that, you know. And so there are a whole bunch of factors in there. But this is a, a reaction that's easy to recharge right here. This is a kind of a weird reaction because, again, the oxidizer is solid here. Um, but the electrolyte, which is the salt, you know, we need a salt bridge. Over here, the salt bridge is just this paste in here, um, or this gel. It's not liquid salt bridge, it's just the paste, but the ions are mobile there. Here, this is actually liquid. This is sulfuric acid in here. Normally, um, a lot of people, uh, sulfuric acid is like syrup, and so in the old, old days, the mechanics would, would put a, a density measuring device called a, I forgot what it's called, but it's a really simple density measuring device to measure how much sulfuric acid's in there because it's really, sulfuric acid will really increase the density of the, of the liquid, and so they call it the specific gravity of it, which is just the density. And so if you have a very specific gravity, then the battery is good, but you know, once the specific gravity goes down, and then you have to refill this with water. They have sealed batteries. The sealed batteries are better because they don't require maintenance, but the old batteries you would have to fill them with water at least once or twice a year or something because evaporation occurs and we don't really well seal with it. But anyway, the cathode is a lead four oxide, which is a solid. And it's embedded in a matrix, and there's some conductor of lead here. The anode's lead, and this generates two volts, this redox reaction. How many electrons are transferred in here? It looks like two electrons. 
sometimes it's hard. When you look at this equation, this is the net redox equation. How can you tell how many electrons are transferred in the net redox reaction here? Which is, well, it's hard to see. When we have the Hackford reaction, it's easy to see because there's two electrons here, two electrons here, two, two electrons. But when we have the net redox reaction, it's hard to see. And the way you do it based on the net redox, because this is a very common question, how many electrons are transferred in this first redox reaction here? The way you would do it is you would determine the oxidation states. So this, this would be lead two over here. This would be lead zero. And this would be lead four. And so lead two here is both the oxidizer and the reducer because um, we go from lead two to lead zero, which is you know, taking electrons, and then it's losing electrons too. So lead, lead two goes to lead four. So one of the leads is the oxidizer, the other lead is a reducer. This reaction. Is the sulfuric acid just like a step here? Or what is it? Um, well, so sulfuric acid is here, it's a product here. Um, it's a reactant. What is this overall? This is really. Isn't that like sulfuric? Oh, this is hydrogen sulfate ion. But sulfuric acid is going to consist of H plus and hydrogen sulfate. Yeah, so, okay, so it's, yeah and therefore it's or here. This is sulfuric acid, H plus and H2, so it's a minus. Okay. Here. And so we did need that there. When you recharge it, then you regenerate the sulfuric acid. You know, because recharging, this is the recharging step here. That's what it is. And so this is the discharging step. And this is 2.02 volts. This is the recharging step. The recharging step is here. We put on a battery charger and we force the electrons to go in the reverse direction. So right now the electron. Um, are going discharge. So this is going from the anode, which would be lead, to the cathode, which would be lead four oxide. When we recharge it, we hook up a power supply here, and the power supply is going to force the electrons in and out. And so when it forces electrons out, we're going to oxidize the lead, and when it forces electrons in, we're going to reduce the lead. And we regenerate sulfuric acid. But um, to figure out how many electrons are transferred, we look at the oxidation states and we change the oxidation states to determine that. You don't have to have these memorized. This is the, you know, All right, this is a button battery, silver zinc button battery. So the anode is zinc. The cathode is a silver optical. Well, the cathode is just this, this case. This case is, excuse me, stainless steel. And on these. And the oxidizer is silver oxide. So silver oxide is solid. And the silver ions in there, it's oxidizing it. So the silver oxide has to come into contact, at least electrically, with the case here. And then it's separated from the zinc, and then there's an electrolyte in here. So we have the zinc anode. This is going to be a case. And we don't want the zinc anode to come into electrical contact with the case. But overall, here's the reaction. No, solid, 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 solid. And so the voltage doesn't drop you know, so much. It's, it's a good thing. And the potential can be high. I mean, the potential here is only 2 volts. This, this is, they're aqueous here, but it's still a lot of solid. You know, when we think about it, solid, 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 liquid. And then just these two are aqueous. That's like the sulfuric acid. That's why you need to make sure of the sulfuric acid. But this is only 2 volts, but the battery is 12 volts. And the car battery is 12 volts. So there's actually six of these put in here. And you put six of these in what's called series. And the volts are additive. So 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. Um, you know, or 2 times 6 gives us 12 volts. Um, this, these are the nickel cadmium. Nickel cadmium, these used to be very popular, but not so much anymore because people throw these away and cadmium is fairly toxic to the environment. And so um, if you throw these in the garbage, then the cadmium can be leached out and, and start contaminating things. So these have fallen out of favor. And there are other batteries. I got some. I was at the... Um, at some of the show, um, they had some alternative um, rechargeable batteries that I've been using with 
monocycle life. Oh, uh, actually, pretty good. Okay. But with these nickel cadmium here, solid, solid, liquid, solid, solid. So they thought of something creative to get the voltage stable. And then um, this is a reversible reaction. It's not too difficult to reverse. So these are easy to recharge. And so that would be a secondary pattern. This is primary. This is, you aren't going to recharge the, the buttons. So. Lithium ion batteries are rechargeable. So these are secondary. This is one way the lithium ion batteries work. And one way is we have a, a crystal here. It doesn't have to be a crystal. It could be uh, a polymer or whatever. And the structure is very important. It has to have a layered structure. So there are layers here. And the layers are only held together by um, intermolecular forces. They aren't actually bonded to one another. This is like graphite. You know, the layers of graphite are just held together by um, dispersion or London dispersion forces or Van der Waals forces. And so the layers can slide on top of one another. You know, and so that's what you need. Actually, you can build a lithium battery using graphite too. So what that means is you can stick stuff between the layers like a sandwich. And so what they do here is they um, just uh, like graphite. Well, speaking of graphite, it's graphite. And so what they do is they get the lithium ions in between the layers here. And that's going to create high potential because now you've got a bunch of positive ions in the layer here. And, and that's unstable. That's going to create a high voltage. And so to charge this, you force the lithiums inside or in between the layers and discharge it and let the lithiums out of the layers. This is called intercalation. And so there are different uh, materials that can intercalate here. There's a layer of lithium here. There's a layer of lithium here. So this. I was looking at the... Since there's a lot of activity with batteries right now. There's something with... The, the Tesla battery, there's some new batteries that they have. Tesla battery. Okay. Battery technology, there's, there's some advances. Okay. Which I didn't put in here, but that's basic lithium battery. There are many different variations of that. Okay. So this is another battery here. This is just a, like a, you know, they have these, um, just add water batteries. Have you ever seen those? Yeah. So this, so this is another way to extend the shelf life of the battery. You just don't have anything in there to cause any reaction. Because, you know, you're going to get some voltage leak in, in a normal battery. That's why they, some batteries claim a 10-year shelf life or something. But there's normally some reaction that's occurring. You can't stop that. Well, you can stop it if there's no electrolyte in there. So you just add water, and you add water, and then then you have the reserve battery. If you put distilled water in there, like yeah, distilled water because they have some salts in there, and that, whatever. And so, um, or you might have to put in salt water. I don't know. This one says until it comes into contact with solution containing ions, but you could put you know, dried salts in there and just have it work. That would that would have an excellent shelf life. 
This is another battery. This is a battery that, um, you know, like a car. If, if, if your car just had a fixed um, gasoline tank, a sealed gasoline tank, and you couldn't put any gasoline in there, then it would be like a primary battery. Right? Once the gasoline runs out, then you can't go anymore. But, um, but you can refill the tank. And so this is a battery where you can just refill the tank. And so, if you can refill the tank, then you can refill the fuel for the battery. And so this is called fuel cell. In fuel cells, what you do is you just add the reactants and you just keep adding. So in this fuel cell, the reducing agent is hydrogen. So hydrogen comes into contact with the anode. This looks like graphite anode. So hydrogen comes into contact with the graphite. What's oxidizing? Oxygen. So oxygen is plentiful. You just use air here. And air is going to come into contact with this. So both of these electrodes are inert electrodes. So the oxygen comes in and tries to strip electrons off the cathode, not possible, but it'll strip off the electrons off hydrogen. So as long as you feed this hydrogen, then this continues to generate electricity. And so they have the hydrogen fuel cell car now driving on the road. In fact, the picture at the beginning of this was a hydrogen fueling station in Torin. This one on 190th, I think. And so the hydrogen fuel cell car, move the hydrogen in there, and then uh, it'll just continue to generate electricity. This is this is one option, you know. Um, but I, I think that there hasn't been much work done on this because everybody's into plug-in electric cars now, you know. But the, the product of this is uh, water. You know, hydrogen plus oxygen yields water. Here, H2O liquid. And so, um, and this is a, a very efficient battery here. Um, efficiency value. We didn't really talk about that. We really aren't going really to talk about that. This is just the work, you know, and how much heat. And a plain deal. Is it more like, because it's from the liquid, does it get, like, it, does it end up turning into like, or does it like funnel it back in or something? No, I, I, I think it just it, it either evaporates. It depends on the operating temperature of these. You know, there, there are hydrogen combustion cars. They have hydrogen combustion cars, not fuel cells. In which they just um, were burning the hydrogen, and then there's a uh, steam would could be coming out of the back, and there are people who would put beaker there and then drink the the uh, the liquid that came condensed out of there. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. But this one, I don't know. You know, if it's H two O liquid, where it goes, probably just goes out the exhaust and drips. But it's probably um, Yeah, not sure. But it's not a huge amount that's of water that's being generated. This is aluminum air battery. So air is a great oxidizer. So air comes in, there's the cathode, and we have an aluminum anode. And the electrolyte here would be sodium hydroxide. So this would be an aluminum air battery. There are some batteries that you don't want, and I guess we're out of time. Are we? Three minutes? It's okay. Uh, there are some batteries we don't want. These are um, batteries that we don't want. You know, air is a great oxidizer, and sometimes we don't want it to oxidize anything. But iron is a good reducer, and so, yeah, this would form a battery. This would be the, um, rather than the aluminum air battery, this would be the iron air battery. But the iron air battery, it, well, we need some electrolyte here. So if there's no electrolyte, then it's okay. So we keep the electrolyte out of there. There's no salt water. So if there's salt water or acid or anything, then it's you just set up an iron air battery. An iron air battery is going to corrode. And so this is showing the iron air battery, and this is in a solution of, uh, of water. This is just water. 
in deionized water, it's going to be very slow. And so um, iron won't rust very well in deionized water, but in salt water it will. But if we have um, deionized water like this and give it enough time, we'll see it. Now, the iron is going to be both the anode and the cathode here. And um, what we do is, um, like here, the iron nail's been hammered at the end. When you hammer iron, you know what you do to the structure? You distort the structure. And you, you create what are called defects in the structure. And when you create defects in the structure, what happens is it becomes more reactive, less stable. And so this is like, if you think about uh, like a, a car, if, the, if, you, if you crash it, one of the fenders or whatever, where does it start to rust? It starts to rust where it was creased or where there's defects. Or the edges or the corners or wherever else, you know, those are hot spots of higher, um, what we call free energy, surface free energy. But we'll talk about this more next time, I think. But we don't have too much time to...